Is is everyone able to hear me now? Hey, we can hear you, Mob. Thank you. Fantastic. Good to see your slides. Hey, thanks so much for great. Thank you. Uh, thanks everyone for having me here. Um, hopefully, what you'll get from us is a little bit of uh, hope and optimism. Um, and we view ourselves at Brightmark as being um, the uh, the real world application uh, as we move out of the test phase of a lot of solutions as it relates to uh, waste issues. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the plastic waste and uh, ultimately the innovation and in how we, uh, we actually create an ecosystem um, and thus create a circular economy with respect to uh, plastic waste, post-use plastics. So let me start with our mission. So at Brightmark, we're on a mission to reimagine waste. And simply put, what we aim to do is change uh, the world by creating a world without waste. And we're actually doing it now in two different ways. Um, I'll focus on the second one as part of this discussion. But just so you know, uh, one of the ways we're uh, seeking to create a world without waste is we actually have projects that create negative carbon, renewable natural gas from animal and food waste with, uh, with benefits including uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 400% when the RNG is used uh, uh, for fuels, which offsets the impact of methane emissions. We also, as part of that process, recover nitrogen and phosphorus from solids, which significantly reduces um, water runoff uh, and water table uh, contamination from those nutrients. And then finally, um, many of our projects support the sustainability of the farming communities uh, with the farmers that we partner with. And those farmers are the ones that feed us all and, uh, and our projects sustain our farms both economically and environmentally. In fact, a little bit earlier today, one of our dairy farmer partners wanted me to remind folks that uh, dairy farms now have committed to net carbon zero by 2050. So uh, we're helping our farming communities be environmentally sustainable as well. So the second one and the, uh, the solution that we'll talk about here is we're actually um, able to reimagine waste by renewing post-use plastics uh, into usable products, some of which um, the prior speaker actually spoke about a little bit here. So for us, as we think about solving these waste problems, our ultimate goal is maximizing circularity. So our solutions are ones that should eliminate waste and reuse our resources. Um, clearly diverting uh, plastic from landfills and waterways is an elimination of waste aspect. And then in this particular area, reusing our resources by turning plastic waste into things like diesel fuel, uh, naphtha, which is either gasoline additive or feedstock to remake plastics, and then waxes. And I saw a question in the last session about lube stocks, uh, certainly lube stocks as well. So reusing those resources from what was discarded. So for us, uh, as I said, we're the practical um, economic um, sort of what we think nexus with the theory. So for us, ultimately, to succeed, we believe we need to set out goals and then demonstrably achieve those goals. So in the next five years, and this year as part of the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, we announced that within the next five years, we intend to divert 8.4 million metric tons of plastics from landfills and the natural environment. Um, of that, we're committing to take 1.7 million tons of the feedstocks uh, and, and remake them back into plastics or plastic feedstocks in truly a circular solution. And then finally, both with our plastic renewal technology and a renewable uh, natural gas technology, we intend to offset the release of 22 million metric tons of greenhouse gas emission CO2 equivalents. Um, I think that's uh, a pretty bold 
an ambitious set of goals. And I think we all know, I probably don't need to uh, repeat too much of this. There's a tremendous amount of plastics out there in the world. And uh, just real quickly to uh, orient uh, and frame up the discussion, 9% globally now, is reused and the prior discussion we talked about mechanically recycling as one of the alternatives that's generally what that nine percent of the plastics that we discard are utilized and then eleven percent globally uh, of plastics are actually incinerated oftentimes in waste to energy solutions we don't find that to be a superior um, answer environmentally um, but what that leaves you with is eighty percent of the plastics globally, worldwide, a tremendous amount. And we can see um, with the marine plastic situation, the imperative we have here. So with the big problem, one of the questions I think people oftentimes ask is, what do we do? Do we, uh, do we ban the plastics? And I say to you, not so fast, folks. And the reason why is plastics are incredibly useful. Um, plastics are a uh, environmentally better al uh, than some of the alternatives in many ways. Uh, you can certainly see as it relates to vehicles and the consumption of uh, fuels, plastics make vehicles more fuel efficient. They make them safer. Uh, they also reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions by the use of plastic packaging. And in this year, 2020, uh, can you imagine going through the COVID crisis without the ability to go to hospitals with plastics there and then the uh, personal protective equipment that we have? It is, uh, plastics are incredibly useful, but we need to figure out what to do once we've used them. So um, people oftentimes ask me questions about alternatives to plastics. And uh, the true cost study that was done a couple of years ago has pointed out that alternatives to plastics oftentimes are not better. And in fact, if you look at the most typical alternatives to plastics, it's a greater damage to health of humans and ecosystems, uh, greater impact, uh, one or two of the reasons I already mentioned as it relates to climate change, and then damage to the oceans as well. So it isn't so easy to simply say, ban the plastics. So then we come to a fundamental question that is part of the Brightmark journey, which is we tried to examine um, as we founded Brightmark over four years ago, um, why do we throw away plastics inherently? What is the problem with plastics? And then if we understood well why we threw away plastics, then how could we solve the problem? And it's pretty simple. Uh, as I said, 80% of the plastics right now that we, uh, we use and uh, throw away uh, currently are not recycled. And they're not recycled because they do not have a current value. In fact, they have a negative value. The cost to throw away to landfill is immense. And in fact, I would argue the reason why we end up with um, plastics in the oceans and waterways is it's an avoidance of the cost to dispose of. And we know that the areas of the world that produce the greatest amount of ocean plastics tend to be the less developed countries who do not have the economic uh, ability currently to have more robust waste management practices. But it's simple. There is no value. In fact, there probably is a negative value associated. But there is value in plastics. So if we take a look here, and many of you are, are pretty familiar with that, this, but plastics are essentially hydrocarbons that are strung together, right? Well, look at motor oil. Motor oil looks very similar. Diesel looks very similar here in terms of the chemical composition. Gasoline does as well. Well, motor oil has value, diesel has value, gasoline has value why don't post-use plastics have value? Because that value is locked up in the form of what we used and discarded. So the question is, 
how could we break apart these carbon and hydrogen atoms in order to perhaps renew and recreate either into these products here, which is certainly possible, or remake them back into plastics. And so at Brightmark, that was the journey that we were on. And it wasn't to look at a theoretical answer, because what we do at Brightmark is we actually own technologies that we can invest in and we can deploy to actually solve the problem on the ground. There's a lot of theoretical uh, math done on what solutions work. I mean, it took us a while to find a solution that worked and we felt it worked at production scale. So, um, but to unlock the value in plastics, there are some changes that need to be made. So this is part of the unlocked value here, right? So if we were to recreate into uh, gasoline, which has value, you can see there's a tremendous amount of plastics if converted back into a product like gasoline, tremendous value. So I think one of the problems we have in addition to the fact that it's a cost is we currently don't have an ecosystem to deal with post-use plastics. Because our ecosystem currently for plastics is, around, is sort of designed around the fact that there's no value or a negative value because you have to landfill plastics. So as we've started to solve the problem, what we have encountered is an infrastructure from a waste management perspective that is not set up to help us solve the problem. And then further, if you look at recreating, renewing plastics, there currently is not an infrastructure because there are no products available outside of mechanical recycling really um, for um, whether it be oil and gas companies, petrochems, those types of companies, because at any scale at all, there currently is not a solution, a new ecosystem that we need to create because we haven't unlocked at scale yet. So going to solve the problem. And this goes to the question um, that we were asked or posing in the prior session here, which is, uh, is it too late? We're going to need to deal with all the plastics, a lot of plastics in order to solve the problem. So we need to do this at a scale that makes sense. And that's certainly what we're aiming toward here. So let me turn to our technology solution. It is base pyrolysis technology. And as we investigated the base pyrolysis technology, um, what we had found with, um, and, and we didn't frankly think we would find this specific patented technology that we bought, what we had found was um, inability to operate at production scale, um, batch processing. Um, there is when you utilize pyrolysis, which I'll describe a little bit more in a second, um, you create um, waste materials around these vessels. Uh, there was not, we had not previously found a way to extract the char, as some call it, and then continuously operate this pyrolysis technology. We actually found the technology that had been invented, a very elegant solution and uh, which had been demonstrated at a scale we believed would operate at commercial scale. Um, so let me tell you what we do with our technology. So what we do is we take the plastic waste and we shred it after collecting it. We remove ferrous and non-ferrous metals. We dry to the extent the uh, plastics are wet for whatever reason. And then we pelletize the plastics. And then with the pelletized plastics, this is where the pyrolysis comes in. We heat plastic pellets in an oxygen starved environment and we create liquids and, uh, and, and vapors as well and turn them into usable products. But let's, so this second step here is what I referred to let me go back right here. So in step number two, where we heat in a vessel, what we're effectively doing is taking this long string of, long strings of 
carbon and hydrogen atoms and we're putting energy into the system and we're breaking them apart. You might say we're taking a hammer and a chisel to break apart the plastics into smaller molecules that still look like hydrocarbon strings, but they're shorter strings, which means that they are now usable. That's what the second step in this process does. And then as I mentioned uh, just a moment ago, what we then do straight away is cool the vapor that's produced. And the, as we cool the vapor that's produced, there are non-condensable gases that are part of the process that we actually feed back as part of the energy inputs to heat our pyrolysis vessels. The liquids that are cooled are then hydro-treated to remove uh, things like sulfur. And then we fractionate or cut into different products those liquids. And the liquids that we're able to produce include products like ultra-low sulfur diesel. It has value. Naphtha, which is a blend stock for gasoline or a feedstock for plastic. That has value. Paraffin wax is to make candles or for food grade wax. That has value. And that that particular area where the waxes are created, a little bit heavier, longer chains of carbon and hydrogen atoms can also be used for things like lube stocks, etc. All of these products have value. Our process is 93% efficient if you include both the hydrocarbon liquids and the non-condensable gas. The 7% inefficiency is a solid inert residue that can be landfilled, actually could be used to make bricks or clay or some other products. We currently uh, are not um, selling those, but those are uh, for landfill purposes currently. So 93% efficient. So one of the common problems we saw in pyrolysis as well was um, many of the technologies that had been invented out there that even would operate at a batch scale could not take all of the plastics. That's the other uh, very interesting in, in uh, application of this elegant solution. We can take all plastics one through seven. Most typically what we're seeing in our waste streams are uh, the three through sevens as um, the PET bottles, as was previously discussed, have a higher value. Oftentimes some of the twos, a few of the fours are also mechanically recyclable as well. But the 80% that everyone throws away, we can take all of them in our process. We can even take the PVC up to an eight to 10% level. That being said, uh, we typically sort out PVC. Um, so we can take one, two, certainly can take threes, uh, but we do sort them out. Four, five, six, seven, we take all of them. And we run a tour seven, back on up and a 93% efficiency. Um, from a greenhouse gas perspective, we are 14% better when you talk about the fuels that we would sell as diesel or gasoline. And the reason why is because we're not extracting crude oil out of the ground. We're actually taking it from plastics and there's tremendous methane emissions associated with extracting crude oil. So we don't have to do that. We're simply pyrolyzing. So great, this sounds really good. You said, uh, Bob, that uh, Brightmark is actually doing it. Tell us about it. So um, in October, 2019, we commenced construction of the first of its kind commercial scale facility that will operate 724, $260 million of financing, uh, which included 185 million of green bonds that Goldman Sachs helped us finance. The remaining amount, we uh, used our own equity at Brightmark. And I'm really happy to report that uh, first quarter next year, we'll be at full production scale. We will be at a scale of 100,000 tons of plastic a year. In fact, right now, I'm happy to report that we produced over 4,500 gallons of liquid material. We actually have also, you can see the plastic pellets here, have already produced over 600 tons of those plastic pellets, uh, most of which are waiting to be converted into their new renewed life as usable products. So once we're up and running, 
in the first phase of that Ashley facility, we will produce 18 million gallons of the low sulfur diesel and the naphtha blend stock and 6 million gallons of wax. And you can see the tremendous greenhouse gas emission offset associated with just the first phase of the Ashley product, um, project. Our technology is scalable. And uh, as we complete the first phase in Ashley, we will actually expand that facility as well with a design capacity of uh, between four to eight times the 100,000 tons per year. Beyond expanding just Ashley, we actually, um, in November of last year, about a year ago, issued an RFP for new sites within the United States here. And I'm happy to say that we have received a tremendous response from communities that want us to locate the next set of our plastic rule facilities here. We had over 100 communities come to us and say, we wanna solve the plastic problem in our community. Can you help us do it? Um, so we couldn't locate the base or the new hubs like Ashley in every community, but we have narrowed down the next set of facilities down to um, the following states in the Eastern half of the US. Texas, Louisiana, Florida, Georgia, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and New York. And uh, first quarter next year, we will announce uh, three locations where we will successively begin to construct our next plastic renewal facilities. In addition, uh, we already, um, because of the, uh, the great um, interest, both from communities and from oil and gas and petrochemical companies, have already commenced developing projects uh, in locations in Europe and Asia Pacific. And you would expect next year to hear about those facilities as well. One other thing to note as part of the expansion is earlier this year to go along with the new planned hubs in the Eastern half of the United States, we issued another RFP, which was a call to procure 1.2 million tons of plastics annually and source those from waste management companies, from uh, NGOs, brand owners, and then other entities as well. And I'm happy to say that we already have uh, letters of intent for 1 million tons of plastics annually. It's pretty amazing. I think people are recognizing that we've got a huge problem here. And I think people see us as being, if not the, certainly one of the biggest opportunities to solve the problem. I'll come back to our goals. They're big, they're bold, and they're ambitious. And we're certainly excited and optimistic about helping solve the problem here. So with that, I'll conclude my discussion and I'm happy to take whatever questions uh, the folks here would have. Excellent talk, thank you very much. Um, if you wanna ask a question, you can use the raise hand feature or ask it in the chat. Um, to get us started, I'll ask a quick question. Um, you know, and I've noticed myself that during the COVID shutdowns that the number six plastics use has skyrocketed due to like, you know, food containers and things like that. So I'm super excited that your process takes those. So how do we as consume as, you know, individual families help you guys get the plastic, you know, is it worth, you know, is it us going to our waste management companies and making sure their recycling is going to you or how, how can we enable this process? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. I think we all have a role in this. And um, as uh, we discussed in the, uh, the previous session here, I think one area is on the regulatory or legislative front aspect of this, right? And I think that as we engage with um, our elected officials, that we should really talk about how we need to solve this problem. And that would include better waste management practices. And I would also say encouraging companies like Brightmark or research efforts, like some of the ones we've talked about here, that also are here to solve the problem. So I think that that's one area. And you know, taking it from a social consciousness issue, which I think plastics have right now, to a now let's take action 
uh, type of point of view. And then I would say, yes, in terms of things like um, engaging with your waste management companies, absolutely. And I think one thing to consider too is as we talk with our waste management companies or municipalities that also are handling waste, let's make sure that we're engaging with them and talking about not wish cycling. So our company is based in San Francisco. Um, so I live in, in California and we have multiple bins. And because I'm an insider, if you will, I know that some of the plastics that I'm throwing in there are simply not being recycled. So we need to uh, engage with waste management entities as well to, um, to make sure that they're looking for real solutions. And then finally, or third, I would say that the brands that we're purchasing our products from, I think that giving feedback to the brand owners that what you would like to see is recyclable content, you need to encourage and help the companies that are solving the problem because if we continue and buy your products and throw them away, we have a crisis that is of immense proportions and we may not be able to pull back from. All right, thank you. The next question um, is coming from the chat. Um, it's regarding PET and PVC. Um, the PET has oxygen and the PVC has chloride that are not suitable for fuels or waxes. So how are these being addressed or removed from your process? Sure, um, absolutely correct. PET has a level of oxygen that would be unacceptable in my process if I ran 100% of PET. So that's the beauty of our process. We don't take just a one. We don't take just a three. We take the mixed streams of plastics. And generally what we're seeing is, particularly from the waste management companies, uh, the bins that come in uh, to us or bales are, have a whole array of different types of plastics. So except for some um, specific situations where maybe we're getting uh, single source plastics, um, we're generally seeing the mixed. Um, we can in our process take up to nine to 10% of PET and the oxygen itself would, uh, is acceptable at that level. We can also take about nine to 10% of the PVC. Um, we don't like to. And in fact, what we do is we're actually sorting out the PVC, the chlorides. Um, uh, but again, if we wanted to, we could certainly, um, we could take nine to 10% of the PVC in there. The problem is it makes our process a little bit more costly. And, uh, and thus we solve that by sorting out most, not all, it's not 100% efficient of the PVCs as well. Thank you. So the next question um, is concerning contamination. So how do you deal with like food contaminations in some of your plastics? Yeah, um, so food contamination is there and will be there. Um, now, we cannot easily take that yogurt container that's full of yogurt, but we can easily take, as we all eat the yogurt, we throw it away, maybe there's a little bit left in there. So there's a lot of tolerance with respect to um, the amount of waste that would be attached to the plastics. Now, when we get our bales in uh, to our facility in Ashley, there, the, we do a big pre-sort. And uh, if you were able to see some of the videos or even come by the facility, what you would see is we have a floor where we have a debaler that automatically debales um, the baled uh, plastics there. And sometimes there's big pieces of wood in there, or believe it or not, one time there was a deer carcass in there, just lots of things that just are not gonna be acceptable. So for those big things, we pre-sort out and, uh, but in terms of food containers and most typical types of containers that have um, contamination, we have a lot of ability to take those in. So we don't need to wash, we don't need pristine plastics to come in. And so part of the process I just mentioned where we sort out PVCs, we're also able to sort out, I think I mentioned this before, things like ferrous and non-ferrous metals and a few things like that. So it's a very accepting 
process from a variability standpoint. But you know, if we, we throw a ton of rocks into uh, our equipment, we're not going to produce hydrocarbon materials. So we take the big stuff out. Okay, our next question is in regards to the feedstocks. Can you comment on the price you're typically seeing and any regionality around it? So let me get a clarification on that. When they say feedstocks, are we talking about the plastics that I'm receiving uh, into my facility? And I can't see the chat box. So uh, Okay, so yeah, I, I believe that would be correct. Yeah, um, yeah, there is variability in uh, the pricing. So first, in the States, we're in a very good competitive situation because most waste management companies, that 80% they throw away or other um, other entities like, well, one, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about an NGO we work with, if I could just share a real quick story and then get to the full answer here. We work with an NGO uh, that's located in Indianapolis. It's called Recycle Force. Recycle Force is uh, a really amazing organization. So they take e-waste and they take the useful items, typically the metals out of e-waste and some other products. And then what they're left over with is plastics. And so we take the plastics. But the other thing that Recycle Force is really good at is uh, taking folks that are formerly incarcerated and providing them training, uh, jobs, so many different things they do for the formerly incarcerated individuals. And their recidivism rate is actually 25% or actually lower than 25% compared to a nationwide average of 77%. So there's another huge value creation uh, there. But back to the, uh, the original part of the question. So when we take things like car seats from Recycle Force, they have to landfill it. We're actually paying them. Now it's not a tremendous amount of money, but we're paying them so that they make money um, from sending us the plastics, net of the transportation costs, so that they actually can take on more individuals who are coming uh, out of the prisons and recycle their lives. So that is an interesting dynamic with some of the NGOs or some of the ocean plastic companies um, as well. So it does vary, um, but most typically in the, um, a lot of the developed countries, we're taking something that would be a cost to dispose in paying uh, a not nominal, more than nominal uh, amount of money. There are some places, Europe in particular, um, because of the plastic market, you do need to competi be competitive in a place like Europe, uh, where, for example, the Netherlands has almost zero plastic waste or waste period because they're waste management practices. And there's a higher value. Our process is very economic because of the cost and the ability to run 24-7. So we actually can compete in a place like Europe. Uh, there are other parts of the world that um, there are tipping fees that we will need in order uh, in parts of Asia, some of the more developed countries in Asia in order to economically operate. So it really varies across the globe. It's a very individualized situation, which is waste management practices more broadly and certainly very specifically for plastics around the globe. We have inherent advantages with our technology costs and ability to operate in scale. All right, and our, our next question is dealing with the pellets. Um, so you talked about how you shred your plastics and make your pellets. Do you also accept uh, pellets from other companies to come into your system? Absolutely. In fact, that's part of our plan. So what, um, because these, and I, and I told you the first phase, the Ashley facility, um, 100,000 tons of plastics a year, um, a lot of capital costs. In fact, the um, each one of the, we call them hubs, if you will, these new uh, site locations actually will cost somewhere around 500 million to a billion dollars each. So you can't really, to get the right economies of scale, locate one in every community. So we have uh, a business model that entails locating a hub, one of these larger facilities, and then spokes where um, you, know, you could think of us, so for example, in Ashley, we're located in Northeast Indiana. We're close to Indianapolis. We're uh, about three and a half hours away from Chicago. 
and then we're uh, reasonably close two and a half hours from Detroit. So in Chicago, what we're going to do is actually have a third party provider create pallets and then deliver them to us. Um, that's a more economical way to do it. And, uh, and frankly, the third party is going to be more efficient at doing it because of the logistics of their waste management processes there. So absolutely, and very specifically in the Ashley case, we're already working on that model. So that works. All right, so the, the next question is, how do you deal with bromine and chlorine in the plastic mix, especially on the end products as um, these are pollutants that may affect the blending of your fuels? Yeah, so the level of uh, bromines and chlorides, and chlorides would be higher if we were to not sort out the PVCs. Uh, you certainly can deal with it, it costs money. So in the back end of our process, the hydro, hydro treating uh, end of the process, um, we do eliminate and the, uh, if you will, the parts per million of any of the uh, items like bromines, et cetera, are incredibly low. And so um, our end products are in a finished state so that, for example, in Ashley, uh, our fully contracted partner is British Petroleum. They take the uh, diesel and then the naphtha on spec for both of those. And then the, uh, the wax, paraffin waxes as well are on spec as well actually for food grade. So it's that back end treating process uh, in terms of the, uh, the bromines and the chlorine as well. We're very low on the chlorine side. All right, so this is a, a, a selfish question. So we're only an hour and a half from Ashley um, here at Notre Dame. Um, you know, once um, we're able to travel and potentially visit facilities, um, would the Ashley plant be open for visitors to tour or at least a group of undergraduates to come and see the facility? Absolutely, Absolutely. yes. Thank you. So if you'll just arrange with us, we'll, we'll, uh, we'd love to host you there. Um, that would be wonderful. Um, and to the best of my knowledge, we don't have any Notre Dame uh, grads yet working on the team. So maybe, uh, maybe we can res resolve or fix that problem as well. So. Fantastic. I, uh, I know there's some faculty on the line that may be willing to hit you up on that as soon as this talk is over. I, I'm sure they will. And we've got some Purdue grads there as well. So uh, at our at our plant. So, you know, you have to and some IU folks definitely need to supply some great Notre Dame folks. All right. Are there other questions? All right. Well, if there are no other questions, um, I'd like to, to thank all of our speakers and uh, thank all of you for joining us for our, our talks. Um, we will take a break and we'll start back at 4 p.m. for our graduate student poster session. Um, so uh, enjoy a, a quick water break and we'll see you back shortly. Thank you very much. Thank you.